morning, would you stand? Uh, 1 Corinthians tells us that the truths of the gospel are of first importance, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was raised. Uh, again, the third day according to the scriptures. We gather to remember and to celebrate those truths. Let's sing. have a seat. Uh, welcome to Community Bible Church. It's great to see you guys. Um, we are so excited to be here beholding the, uh, the glory and the grace of Jesus Christ and to be remembering those truths of the gospel that are of first importance um, that really define who we are, what we believe, uh, how we worship, and what we do. Uh, so as we continue this morning, I want to first uh, welcome any guests. If, you are, if it's your first time here at CBC, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, and want to welcome you and ask you if you would take just a moment this morning to fill out a connection card. You can find that on uh, a little clipboard underneath one of the seat backs in front of you. Um, and that's just going to let us know that you were here this morning and allow us to introduce ourselves a little bit more to you later this week. Um, and you can drop that off at the connection desk on your way out later today. And they've got a little gift that, uh, that we want to give to you just to thank you for being with us this morning. Um, but as we continue, we want to pause for a moment and uh, uh, just take a second to collect our thoughts and to center our focus on King Jesus, uh, on the one who we're here to behold and to worship, because um, we're coming in with all kinds of distractions and noise and struggle uh, from the world around us from the week, and so we, we like to take a moment to, um, to kind of get focused and centered as we worship. So let's take a moment to do that, to ask the Lord to move among us, and then I'll lead us in prayer.
Father, would you help us to um, behold and to remember these truths that we're singing about? To remember the truths that have, uh, the, the, thing, the things that have saved us and gathered us, the things that unite us. Um, to remember who you are and to remember what you've done for us as your people in Christ. And then I pray that we would, uh, uh, as we do that, that we would rest in Jesus. Uh, as we talked about and sang about and heard about last week, I pray that you would, would lead us to trust and to rest, lead us to joy and satisfaction that is found in Jesus. As we bring our nothing, Lord, as we uh, acknowledge and as we come uh, weary, broken, lost, and desperate apart from Christ, would you remind us of the work of Christ, the finished work of Christ on our behalf that has reconciled us to you, remind us of the promise of of perfect and final and eternal rest that is already ours in Jesus. And would you lead us into that rest uh, this morning as we sing to and sing about and are reminded of uh, the rock of ages and the refuge and shelter for our souls. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. think about Jesus, our rock of ages, we're going to turn our attention to a psalm, to Psalm 62, that expresses hope and confidence and rest in God, who is our rock and our refuge and our fortress. 
And we need, this, we need to sing these kinds of words. Um, I need to sing these. You need to sing these. Uh, because our souls, as the psalm talks about, our souls often feel shaken um, by the experience of living as the people of God in a fallen and broken world. We feel shaken often by uh, the suffering and loss and struggle and even the doubt. Um, that's part of life here. That's part of our experience here. And so we're going to sing some words that come straight out of Psalm 62 that express our hope uh, as we wait in God, as our souls wait for him. And as we were talking about this passage um, before our rehearsal on Thursday night, Carly um, brought up this really important point and kind of distinction. uh, Because one of the statements that comes up a couple of times in the psalm uh, and that we sing in, uh, in uh, in the song is that I will not be shaken. Um, as we rest in God, our rock. And the important thing, and the, the, really, uh, the really interesting thing, is that this is not a statement that's like a, a little internal pep talk. I'm not telling myself, like, come on, I won't be shaken. Like, come on, soul. It's not what we're doing. We're making a statement of fact that's grounded in the character and the promises and the faithfulness of God. I might feel shaken. I might be afraid that I'll be shaken. But because God, who is my fortress and my rock and my salvation, is not shaken and cannot be shaken, I will not be shaken. He won't allow it. He holds us and he upholds us. So we need to sing words like this because my soul needs to be reminded. Our souls need to be reminded. And we need to sing reminding each other of the truths that God is our salvation and our rock. So our souls will not and cannot be shaken. So Carly's actually going to read Psalm 62, and then she's going to sing through the chorus. You guys sing along as you catch it, just so we can kind of uh, kind of learn it together. Uh, And then we're going to sing the song. We're going to testify that these things are true. We're going to encourage our souls and encourage each other with this truth. Carly, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock. And my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him, like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken... Twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken, my soul.
foundation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. You are my comfort when I feel forsaken, my refuge and my sure foundation, my soul. to uh, rest in that reality and we want to worship you uh, because the things that we are singing are absolutely true. Um, you are our rock and our fortress and our salvation, our sure foundation, uh, who will not be shaken. And so, Lord, we worship you and, uh, and we trust you. And we rest in you. And we confess that that is difficult for us. And we confess that, um, that our worship and our trust are both um, so often broken and even, even like half-hearted. And so we, uh, we pray saying that we worship and trust you. And we, uh, we pray asking you to help us to worship and trust you more fully. Um, and, and in the way that you deserve and the way that you are worthy of. We pray, Lord, that we would believe that our souls will not and cannot be shaken as we lift our eyes to the one who's our refuge and the one who cannot be shaken. And so while we confess our weakness and our struggle, we, uh, we look up in hope and in confidence and in complete and utter dependence on your goodness, on your sovereignty, on your power, and on your faithfulness, knowing that you will work for us, you will work in us. And you will not let us go. You will not let us fall. Uh, Lord, we pray um, as your people that you would root us in those kinds of truths and, and uh, send us out um, on mission in the way that those kind of truths send us. Um, we pray that you would do that not just in our churches, but we pray that you would do that in your people around the world. And we want to remember one particular church that... Uh, is our gospel partner here in, uh, in Jacksonville, Paramount Church. And we pray for them, uh, for their pastor, John Fonville. We thank you for the faithful work and ministry and mission of the gospel um, that's, uh, that's present there and that you are working out in them and through them. And we pray that you would continue to bless them and multiply their, uh, their discipleship and their worship and their mission. Use them in Jacksonville and beyond to do great things and many things for the glory of your name and for the advance and growth of the gospel and your kingdom. Uh, we pray as we hear from your word now that you would um, bless it and, and move powerfully in us as we hear. Uh, we know that your word 
is powerful and that your word is alive and that your word does not return empty, that it's going to do the things that you set out for it to do. And so we pray that that would be true in us, in each of us individually, and in us as a whole, as a church body. Uh, Change us, encourage us, make us more like Jesus as we open your word together. We pray in his name. Amen. Good morning. If you've got a Bible handy, go with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2 today. If you do not have a Bible and you don't have it on your phone within easy access, there are Bibles that are in the chair racks in front of you. If you look up and down the row, you should find one. And Genesis is the very first book of the Old Testament, so if you start paging a little bit, uh, you'll find Genesis 2 pretty quickly. And if you do not have a uh, Bible and you'd like to, to take that one, congratulations, that one belongs to you now. You can feel free to walk out of here with it. I uh, want to say before we get started this morning, it is a, a pleasure and a privilege to have Jazz back in our services with us, uh, pointing her out. Um, I won't point her out more than that. Of course, everybody's looking for her now. Uh, so uh, there she is. She's standing up. See, she's, she can handle it. Uh, she has been uh, in New York City, as all of you know, for, uh, the, past, uh, for the past almost year now, um, doing some missions training, uh, has had a lot of great experiences there, a lot of difficult experiences there, a lot of self-discovery as we go through a series, uh, we go through times like that in our lives, um, but she has, uh, has already met with some of you who are some of her supporters, and I just want to encourage you. Uh, to see her today. If you have not had a chance to touch base with her, she'll be here after the service, and we'll be happy to, uh, to talk to you about what God has been doing in her life uh, as she has been in New York City and just has, what, a month left? Uh, roughly a month left, so not, not very long, and then it's on to the next thing. So we're very, very glad to have you with us today. We have missed you. Okay, she's missed you too, in case you couldn't hear that. <clears throat> All right, so you should be in Genesis 2 if you want to be able to be there and follow along with us today. I can still remember the feeling of excitement that I had when I was a kid whenever I saw a Disney movie starting. Uh, I can remember that the, the intro to every Disney movie, that this is the way it's always been, uh, but the intro to every Disney movie has this castle that it appears. And back when I was watching Disney movies before animation was really invented, uh, that, that the castle that would appear in front of these movies was, was not as elaborate as it is now. It was just kind of that blue background and it, this like line would, would go down the screen and then like the white castle would be there and a little thing would go over it. And, and I can remember being so excited as a kid when I would see that that Disney castle, you know, now it's much more elaborate. Uh, they've got, you, if, uh, you, your point of view kind of comes sweeping down through the clouds. You can see this aerial view of whatever kingdom that is, and all the lights are on. It's twilight. There's this river running through it. Uh, uh, a, uh, uh, tra- a steam engine is like going over a bridge, and you can see the puffs of of steam coming out, and then, as, then the castle comes into view, and as you zoom away from the castle, uh, the lights are all on, and fireworks are going all over it. It's, it's twilight, and it's just this, this, this gorgeous scene. And I can remember that when I, was, when I was a kid and I saw this, it wasn't just excitement that I felt. I also felt something that can only be described, I can only describe to you as a sense of longing. And I think that sense of longing was due to a couple of facts. One is when you see that castle and you see this magical world, you're still an outsider. You're on the outside looking in. The doors of that place are shut. It's It's a land that you can't actually enter into. And there's another reason why I think I felt that sense of longing, and it's because it's not real. Like, it's this magical place, and it looks amazing, 
and it's exciting, but it, it doesn't exist. And you can buy a ticket to kind of go see it, but there's like 7 billion other people there. And you can't even take a picture of it because there's 7 billion people there. <laughs> that may sound completely crazy to you, and if it does, I do not blame you at all. I take comfort in the fact that C.S. Lewis seemed to understand whatever it was that I felt. He said in The Weight of Glory, a sermon that was turned into an essay, he said, our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside, is no mere neurotic fancy, but the truest index of our real situation. And to be at last summoned inside would be both glory and honor beyond all our merits and also the healing of that old ache. Lewis describes this feeling in terms of an ache inside of us, a a, a feeling of being cut off, of, of always being on the outside and, and never really being in. His friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, I think understood this sense of longing too, although he hated Disney with an absolute passion and was not afraid to say so in writing. <laughs> But Tolkien understood this feeling, and he, and he connected it with something in Genesis. In a letter, Tolkien described it this way. He said, we all long for Eden, and we are constantly glimpsing it. Our whole nature at its best and least corrupted, its gentlest and most humane, is still soaked with a sense of exile. I want you to let that hauntingly beautiful phrase sink into your soul. Soaked with a sense of exile. I think Tolkien is correct. This sense of longing that we feel, and this may be something that you have sensed from the time you were a child, it may be something that you've never sensed at all, we experience things in different ways depending on how self-reflective we are or, or not, but each one of us, whether we feel it strongly or whether, it, whether we experience it at and, and fits and starts and bits, bits and sna uh, snatches through our lives, we feel this sense of longing, this sense of exile, and it is connected to a place called Eden. And it's Eden that we want to spend some time thinking about this morning. We're introduced to Eden in Genesis chapter 2. And I'd like to read that description to us, for us, together, to get our thinking started. If you're there in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 8. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, the Word of God says this, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. 
The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, the beginning of this section is actually found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, we see the first of those 10 markers that divide the book of Genesis up for us that you may remember. These are these, this is that little phrase that we find in 10 different occasions throughout the book that give us a sense of structure for it. And that phrase is, these are the generations of. And when Genesis says, These are the generations of, it's starting a new section that says this is a story of what happened to whatever is then mentioned. What chapter 2 does is it is going to take what's happened in chapter 1 in the creation week and it's going to zoom in on the crown jewel of creation. The crown jewel of creation is human beings the creatures that God has made in His own image and likeness. And so we're going to be looking in the coming weeks on what the Bible has to say as it zooms in on these human beings. But before we do that, I want to focus on the location in which these human beings were placed. And I want to make five statements about this place that are rooted in chapter 2, and then unfold, unwind, unspool themselves throughout the rest of the Scriptures. Here's the first statement I want to make about this place. The Garden of Eden was a luxurious place. It was a luxurious place. Eden, the word, comes from a word that, that, that means pleasure or delight. Eden is a place... And the garden is in the place that is Eden. We sometimes think of the whole thing as as that, but the Bible actually talks about the garden that is in Eden. And the Bible tells us that this garden is filled with trees that are both aesthetically pleasing, they're beautiful, and it is these trees are good for food. There are two trees that are particularly named in this garden. We have on the one hand the tree of life, And we have, on the other hand, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, we'll have more to say about those trees in a later message. Verses 10 to 14, you might have noticed, kind of go out of their way to describe the luxury of this garden. There's a river that comes out of Eden that flows through this garden to make it a lush place, to make it a well-irrigated place, and then this river itself splits up into four other rivers that, that send that abundance to the surrounding areas. And when I read about these four rivers, I immediately thought, this is why that barbecue is so delicious, named after Eden. Uh, but it's not, actually. I looked it up on their website, and the guy that started Four Rivers His last name is Rivers, and there's four of him in his family. So that's why it's called Four Rivers. But their website does say, sometimes when you're doing sermon prep, you go down a rabbit hole and start exploring. (laughs) You start exploring all these things that have zero relevance to the the sermon. So I did quite a bit of studying about Four Rivers Barbecue this week. (laughs) Uh, And they do say on their website that uh, they are aware, the the guy that found it is a Christian, he's aware that that Four Rivers also has something to do with uh, Genesis 2 that we talked about. So, there you go. Uh, who says that wasn't relevant for the sermon? Okay, so we got four rivers that are, th- this river is dividing into four rivers. These are proceeding from the garden and they're irrigating the surrounding lands. And we're also told that the surrounding areas are rich with natural resources and, and expensive resources. There's gold to be found, there's jewels, there's... There's other things that are there. So the Garden of Eden, we see, first of all, is a luxurious place. The second place I want us to see, the Garden of Eden was a workplace, a workplace. We see this luxurious place described for us, and it might be tempting to think that God created a resort. 
And he put Adam and Eve in it, and the thing that they could do in that resort was sit back on their lounge chairs and try different kinds of exotic fruit each day, you know? Have you tried star fruit yet? Or have you seen, you know, imagine when we went to, to have taken teams to Brazil, there's all these fruit trees in Brazil that I didn't even know existed. There's like 30 kinds of fruit that, that I'd never even heard of. So imagine that on, a, on, a, on an even larger scale in this place. But, and of course, Adam and Eve are able to enjoy the garden. But this is not supposed to be an extended vacation for them. The Bible tells us, and we talked about this last week, that God gives Adam both a task and a test while he's there. And the task is mentioned in verse 15 of the verses that we read. The man is placed in the garden to, quote, work and keep it. He's to work and keep it. So he is given responsibility for this place. And what the Bible, I think, is telling us here is that the garden is a, is a place that reflects intentionality in the way that the rest of the world does not yet reflect it. Because so our, our tendency is to think that basically God created the world and the whole thing is this gigantically, perfectly done garden. And that's not really the picture the Bible gives us. It talks about a garden that's in Eden, that's cultivated, and it's, and it's arranged, but humanity has the responsibility to then have dominion and to go throughout the rest of the earth to cultivate and subdue and to keep. And so there's a sense in which Eden is a template. It's a template, and, and humanity is to, to make the whole earth Eden. This is this cultivated place, and by being fruitful and multiply and going throughout the earth, this is going to be extended to the ends of the earth. And so, humanity is given a task to work and keep it. As I said, along with that task, there is a test. Adam not only has a responsibility to the land, but he has a responsibility to God, his creator. And he's told that he can eat of every single tree in the garden without exception, uh, with the exception, though, of one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God warns him that if he eats of the fruit of that tree, he will surely die. The Hebrew there is literally dying you will die. So it's kind of a Hebrew way of underlining is this is really bad. Dying, you will die. And imagine hearing that as a person who has no experience with death. I mean, we we hear you will surely die, and we're like, yep, I've got all kinds of death that I can think of in my life. But imagine him hearing that with no reference point of what exactly that means or how significant it is. Again, we'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 3. So we've seen that the garden was a luxurious place. The garden was a workplace. Now I want us to see, thirdly, that the Garden of Eden was a sacred place. The Garden of Eden was a sacred place. And Eden is a sacred place because this is where the presence of God was manifested. In fact, the the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, says that the presence of the Lord was among the trees of the garden. Now, when the Bible says that that the presence of the Lord was among the trees of the garden, it's not saying that He was there as opposed to other places. You and I can be in one place at one time, although all of us would like to develop the ability to be in multiple places at one time. When the Bible talks about God manifesting His presence in a particular place, He does not do so at the cost of His omnipresence. There is is no place in the universe where God isn't. He is in the furthest reaches of the universe. He is in the the deepest deepest depths of the sea. God is everywhere present. All of God is everywhere all the time. And yet the Bible speaks on numerous occasions and here in Genesis of God manifesting His presence in a particular place in a unique way. Throughout the rest of Scripture, we see God 
manifesting or revealing His presence in a particular place in a unique way. And what place does He do that? Well, that would be the tabernacle or the temple. The tabernacle is is where, is where the worship of God is centered after the people of Israel are released from Egypt. They're, they're traveling to the promised land or they're, they're going through the wilderness wanderings and they're, they're packing the tabernacle up and then unpacking it at a particular location. But this is, this is the place where God is manifesting His presence. Then when they have a permanent location and Solomon builds this magnificent temple, it, there, is this, there is this display of God's glory as it fills this whole place at the dedication of the temple. And while God is omnipresent, existing everywhere at the same time, He manifests His presence in a unique and special way in the temple in which He has chosen to demonstrate His presence. Why do I say all that? Well, there are many students of the Bible who see hints In our text here that are unfolded throughout the rest of the story, hints that Eden is a sort of temple. Now, this may be a new idea to to some of you, so I'll lay out a few reasons for this, and I'll I'll just give you a few. This is taken from a guy by the name of Greg Beal, and he lists nine reasons, so you'll be happy to know I'm sparing you all nine of those reasons. You can... Uh, you can think a little bit about this on your own time later. But I'll just, give you, I'll just give you three. The first hint that what we've got going on here is more than just a garden, that this is a sacred place, that this is a, a sort of temple, is the language that's used here that then is used in other places throughout the rest of the Old Testament in a temple or a tabernacle context. Let me explain what I mean by that. One of the things we just saw in chapter 15 is that the Bible tells us that that Adam is placed here to work and keep it, right? Those, Those are the words that are used, work and keep. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, we find those exact Hebrew words used a lot of times where they're also translated as serve and guard. Serve and guard, and the context in which we uh, frequently find those words of serving and guarding used are in the context of the priests serving either in the tabernacle or in the temple. And in other places in the Old Testament where these two words are put together like they are in our text, the context is always the temple or the tabernacle. So the priests had a responsibility as they're serving the Lord in His place to to serve Him and to guard anything unclean from entering the temple. Now, if that's a a new concept to you, uh, you don't have a lot of biblical background, don't worry about that too much. We don't have time to tease that out. But the bottom line is one of the priest's responsibilities in the temple was to guard that which was unclean from entering into the temple, because the temple was a holy place. And so we have this same terminology that's used in those contexts. I'll give you a couple examples that you can write down to look at later. Numbers chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. 1 Chronicles chapter 23 and verse 32. And Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 14. This, these words are put together in this kind of context. And as we're going to see... Adam has a responsibility to guard this place, and when something unclean enters the garden, what does he do? Does he guard it? No. (laughs) He doesn't guard this sacred place the way he was intended to do. So there's language used here that when we read throughout the rest of the Bible should spark us and say, well, wait a minute, I think I've heard this phrase before. What are the biblical authors trying to tell me? That's one reason. There's a second hint that Eden is a sort of temple, and that is the fact that, that the, the, uh, the temple and the tabernacle are decorated in ways that are meant to evoke the imagery of the garden. Out of all the scenes, out of all the ways that the temple, temple and the tabernacle and the priestly garments could have been 
could have been designed. They could have been designed with scenes from the wilderness wandering. They could have been designed with scenes depicting, depicting God's miraculous release from Egypt. They could have had people depicted on them. They could have had could have had other city imagery from the coming promised land put on them, but the imagery that is woven into the priestly garments, the walls of the tabernacle, carved into the temple, is all garden imagery. And so there's another hint there that Eden is a temple of sorts. There's another, a third hint that I want to point out to you, and it's the fact that, that, that throughout the rest of the Old Testament, God's temple is often spoken of as resting on a mountain. In numerous places, we, we see that the temple is described as resting on a mountain. God, the Bible talks about God's holy mountain. In fact, when you think about the temple site in Jerusalem today, it's called the Temple Mount. Well, there's a reason why it's called the Temple Mount. It's because in the Old Testament, it was conceived of as the temple resting on God's holy mountain. Well, there's a connection between Eden and a mountain because in Ezekiel 28, verses 13 and 14, it refers to the location of Eden as resting on the holy mountain of God. Now, I know I've just, I've just thrown a whole bunch of stuff at you real quick, and there's more that could be explored there than the time that we have Allows, and I've got one more that I'm going to give you later on in the message. But suffice it to say that there are all these breadcrumbs, there are all these hints that tell us that Eden is a sort of temple where the presence of God dwells with his people. Okay, now the fourth statement that I want to make about this place. In the fourth, in the fourth place, the garden of Eden was lost. The Garden of Eden was lost. For those of you who are completely new to the biblical storyline right now, I've got a spoiler alert for you. You might want to plug your ears. Humanity fails the test. Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit in chapter 3. And when, when Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, their ability to fulfill their purpose, as we've already discussed in past weeks and are, and are going to talk in the future when we get to chapter 3, their ability to fulfill the task is significantly harmed. But there is an additional consequence that's, particular to, that's particularly relevant to what we are talking about today. Because not only are they unable to, fill, to complete their task the way they were originally intended, but they are ejected from the garden. They're ejected from the garden. And the Bible tells us why that happens in Genesis chapter 3. It's so that they would not eat of the tree of life in their corrupted state. The Bible says this in Genesis 3, verses 23 and 24, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, when we read something like that, there's some perplexing imagery there about a flaming sword that's facing every direction, and we're not exactly sure how to sort all of that out. The point that I want to make to you today is simply the Bible telling us that, that mankind is ejected from Eden. And this is significant. And we need to understand why this is significant. When humanity is kicked out of the garden, if we stick with the Sunday school version of the story that we've been taught, we might, we might mistakenly walk away with the understanding that, that what's happening here is that there's this nice place that they can't live in anymore. And it's, it's almost like, well, you can't live in the resort anymore if that's what you're going to do. But there's something more significant going on here than them simply being uh, kicked out of, their, uh, out of Eden. When humanity is exiled from the garden, remember the garden is where God's presence is. 
when humanity is exiled from the garden, there is also then an exile from God's presence. And that's the significance of what is going on here. It's not just that they have to file an address change with the post office, which is sometimes all it is to us. It is that, it is that there is a something, something fundamental broken signified in this ejection from the garden. And so this is what Tolkien was talking about when he said that human nature is soaked with a sense of exile. You and I, whether we are consciously aware of it or not, were created for relationship with God. And whether we recognize it or not, we sense that brokenness and we Feel that longing. We recognize that there is there is something not right. And I may not be able to articulate what it is, and I may not be able to put my finger on it, but I am I am disconnected with something fundamental to myself. I am in a very real sense on the outside looking in. There is an ache that we feel, and it is that sense of separation from our Creator. It is a longing deep within us for something that has been lost. It is, to, it is the desire to be brought back into the presence of God, to feel that relational closeness that we were created for once again. It would be a very sad thing if this is where our story ended. But praise God, it doesn't. And there's a fifth statement that I want to make to you. Number four, the Garden of Eden was lost. But in the fifth place, the Garden of Eden will be regained. The Garden of Eden will be regained. The reason the Garden of Eden will be regained is because the Bible tells us of a second Adam. The Bible uses the language of Jesus as a second Adam, both in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in Romans chapter 5. And this second Adam is Jesus Christ, and he is announced with a special name when he is coming into the world. They said, you will call his name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. The very announcement of his name is the announcement is that of, the, of there being a reversal of something that was lost at the very beginning. So it's fitting then that if everything began in a garden, we would find Jesus the night before he is crucified, in a garden. And where we see Adam in the garden being given a responsibility to obey God, representing humanity before God and plunging humanity into sin because he fails, we see the second Adam in the garden of Gethsemane asking a question, is there another way? Could this cup pass from me? And yet, He knows that in obedience to the will of His Father, He must go to the cross for our sins. The first Adam fails in a garden. The second Adam succeeds in a garden. The first Adam failed to obey God. The second Adam obeyed God perfectly and then laid down His life for our failures. What for the first Adam was paradise lost is for the second Adam, paradise regained. So you might be looking around and saying, so where's that paradise? Because I ain't seeing it. You're right. We are not yet seeing it. Which is why when we experience beautiful places when we go on grand vacations, when we visit parts of the world that we've never seen, none of those things quite satisfy us. We never feel like we're actually, we've arrived, we're there, we're in. 
But there is somebody who has seen it. His name is John. And John had a vision at the end of Revelation, the last book in your New Testament. In chapters 21 and 22, John sees things in his vision which tie all of these strands together, which weave them together, and which we see the echoes of Eden at the end. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, we talked about this last week, John reports that he sees a new heaven and a new earth. What John is reporting to us is that he is seeing a new creation. And not only does he see a new creation, but he sees a city, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven into this new creation. And as he begins to describe this city that's situated in the new creation, there are all kinds of links that walk us back through the Bible storyline, all the way back to the opening chapters of Genesis. Let me share some of those links with you. First, in verse 3 of Revelation 21, John tells us, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. That's something that was lost. And something that John is declaring has been regained. It goes on to say, He, referring to God, will dwell with them. And, and, and they will be His people. There is a restoration of the presence of God that was lost in the garden. And as John is, is, is surveying the scene in this, in this heavenly vision, he noticed that there is something missing. And he points it out in verse 22 of Revelation chapter 21. He says, and I saw no temple in the city. Why? Is that an omission? Is that a mistake? No, he says, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So just as there is no physical temple in the garden, there is no physical temple in the new creation because the whole thing is a temple where God's presence dwells. Secondly, another, a second link. This heavenly city that John sees is as, as a luxurious place reminiscent of Eden. John goes out of his way as the author in Genesis goes out of his way to describe the luxury of this place. I mean, we're talking about we're talking about jewels everywhere. They got so many jewels, they're making they're making gates out of them. They've got so much gold in the city, they paved the road with it. I don't know how that works. The point is this is a luxurious place. It reminds us, it echoes back of those four rivers, the gold and the, the luxurious nature of that place. There's a third link with Genesis. In verse 27 of Revelation chapter 21, John says, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. This sacred city in the new creation, this, this temple where God dwells, it is a sacred place. And whereas the first Adam failed, as all the priests after him failed to keep uncleanness out of God's temple, now in the new Jerusalem and in the new heavens and new earth, it is going to be a sacred place where the second Adam ensures that nothing unclean will ever enter it again. I got one more for you. The fourth link backwards we run into as we move into chapter 22. As we move into chapter 22 and we see John describing what he sees in his vision, we find out that he is not just describing a concrete jungle when he describes this city it is not steel and glass and concrete and sharp angles. This city has many features that echo Eden. It's unmistakable. Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 says, Then the angel showed me the river 
of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of, of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life happens to make an appearance. With its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Well, we've never seen that before. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So we've got a river. We've got a tree. We've got fruit. The new creation vision of Revelation is not simply the recovery of what was lost in Eden. The new creation vision of Revelation is actually better than the beginning. It is what Adam could have gained had he obeyed. God would have been in his complete rights to let all of those blessings be lost. And yet the Bible tells us the second Adam comes, not only to restore the beginning, but to give us something that is far greater than the beginning ever was. It is nothing less than the full realization of God's original, eternal intent for humanity. That's remarkable. We've got to learn to read the Bible like this. If the Bible get, just gets chopped up into little vignettes with no connection to each other, we miss the point. So let me say a few things in closing to you briefly this morning. If you are here with us this morning and you are not a Christian or you're not sure what it means to be a Christian. If you have never been saved, there is an invitation in Revelation here for you from God Himself. One of the things that God says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6 is this, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Don't let that good news just pass you by this morning. There's a story from the ministry of Jesus where he is standing at a well and he's talking to a woman and he tells her that he's got water that she can't draw from that well. He tells her, if you draw from this well, it will quench your thirst in this moment but you can get water from me, which if you drink of it, you will never be thirsty again. What in the world is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the rivers of water that bring eternal life. And I don't know whether you can put your finger on what's been wrong inside of you your whole life, or whether you're able to articulate it, or rather you've even been aware of it, but the Bible tells us that you have your relationship, as all of us do, our, your relationship with God has been fundamentally broken. And whatever that feeling that's there, it's that. And you can't fix it. The Bible is not a book of self-improvement. The Bible is not a book with lists of rules that you have to follow so that when you stand before God someday, you can say, this is the best I could do. Can you work with it? The answer is no. Which would be bad news if the book of Revelation did not say to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment, which means that the only thing you need to bring to God is your thirst. You put your faith in the second Adam, 
who was obedient where you have not been, who died on the cross for, your, for your sins. You put your faith and your trust in him, and you experience a, a, a satisfaction that you can't buy or get anywhere else in this earth. To those of us who do know Christ, we have the hope, and you have the hope, that one day you are no longer going to be, in Tolkien's words, soaked with a sense of exile. One day, you are no longer going to be on the outside looking in. One day, that ache of longing that nothing takes away is going to be satisfied. Because you are going to be in the presence of God who according to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. As we're going to sing in just a moment, is all creation groaning, as Romans 8 says? It is. Is a new creation coming? Well, in fact, it is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Let's stand, let's sing. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Of all blessing and honor and glory, is He worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves. He Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal? And open the scroll The lion 
of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. Respond uh, by joining the song that heaven is singing and joining the song that we're going to sing along with for all of eternity, declaring how great and how worthy our God is, how worthy is the Lamb who was slain for us and who's going to make all things right and all things new. So we respond by joining that song and we respond with action. We respond with lives that reflect that same kind of worship, that same kind of worth of Jesus. Um, lives that are lived for the glory of Jesus on the mission of Jesus. So uh, we get a few ways, a lot of different ways as a church that we can, um, we can partner together to do that. One is just by giving. So when we remember the work of God and what God has given to us in the gospel, uh, we respond by giving to support the mission that the gospel calls us to. We've got several different ways that we can do that. Those are listed up on the screen. Uh, and if you're a guest with us, we just want to make sure that you know um, that, that we don't want you to be pressured or feel obligated in any way to give us your money. We're not after your money. We're just glad that you're here. Um, this is something that we do as members of Community Bible Church who have been united together in Christ by the gospel and then called to the mission of advancing the gospel together. So this is an opportunity for us as members to, uh, to pursue that mission together. And then uh, we also take action, right? We, uh, we live differently because of the truth of who God is and the truth of what he has done. Um, and so one of the ways that we do that is by serving the people around us. The gospel calls us to love our community, to love our neighbors, uh, and to love and care for the, to our city, the place that God has placed us and, uh, and called us. So we heard last week about some upcoming opportunities through community service days that are happening on two Saturdays in April, on the 9th and the 23rd. And I want to give you guys just a little bit more information specific to the first one on April 9th so you know what you're signing up for if you were to sign up for, uh, for that particular day. Um, so we're going to be partnering with a place called Seamark Ranch in Green Cove Springs, and, uh, and they're doing a mud run that day. So, uh, so we're going to help with uh, coordinating some of that. They need people to um, work the sign-in tent and booth, give out participant bags. Um, they need people to man water stations, because if you're running apparently three miles through the mud, you need some water along the way. Um, they need people uh, kind of manning the obstacles, not like pushing people into the obstacles, but like making sure they don't do that. <laughs> you know, uh, man the obstacles and kind of <clears throat> um, act as guides, keep people on the course uh, and things like that. So we have some, uh, those are some of the things that, that you'd be doing uh, if you sign up for that work day on, on April 9th. And I'm also told that um, if you volunteer at the event, once the mud run finishes, you can actually do the run. If you want. Like, I don't like running or mud, so I don't know, but some of you might be into that. If you are, volunteer, and then you can do this, uh, do this mud run at the end. Uh, but that's April 9th. We've got, uh, as I said, a, a bunch more opportunities on the 23rd. There's actually a QR code on the back of your bulletin this morning that you can use to, uh, to access the registration links for either of these days uh, if you want to be part of these community service projects. Ross is also going to be at a, a small booth or table 
um, out in the Connection Center. You'll see him on your way out. And uh, if you have questions or you want to get registered for one of those things, follow the QR code or go talk to Ross on your way out. But we're really excited to, uh, to take a couple of Saturdays this spring to be out in our community, to um, uh, hopefully make some gospel connections with people that can lead to some gospel conversations and just to love the people around us and serve them. Our benediction this morning comes from uh, the very end of Revelation 22 in response to all of the things that we have heard and sung and celebrated this morning. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Go in the grace of our God.